Last month, I promised releases of my game by the end of the year, and with the new year rolling in, well, I mostly just worked through the holiday. And with Christmas now a distant memory, time still continued to creep forwards and the project needed to be progressed. But there were still mountains of work to do and I had to be sure to keep focused. Finally, I had a save system, improved gameplay, and I also added a good few features, all the while working towards a functional release. So, here's a devlog for a game which is still in development and will probably remain in development for quite a while. Also, subscribe. Hey, so let's start with the save system. If you're not aware, this is a game about exploration and discovery where I'm attempting to boil down the more complex parts of an open world fantasy game into quite a tight gameplay loop. You explore, kill monsters, find items, use those items to level up. But of course, you can't really have a proper level system unless you have a proper save system. And I didn't have one. And turns out they're actually quite difficult to write. Here's the problem. You need to write the state of the game through a file somewhere where it can be read back in and the game returns to the same exact state it was before. You need to actually validate the data that's coming back in to make sure nothing went wrong. You basically need to do every single possible thing in your power to make sure that nothing happened to corrupt the save file while you're doing that. And what happens when things start to get a bit weird? Like, for instance, you need to add new values to the save file scheme. That, in theory, means that you need to start versioning your save files. But then also what happens if, say, the user hasn't played the game in a year and you've gone through like three or four different versions of the save file. So in theory, they do still have a valid save game on their system. It's just that the game has been updated accordingly. How does that work? All of these things need to be handled gracefully and the player also needs to be alerted of the fact that something went wrong. So in that case, if grandma's old save file gets passed down through the generations to her grandchild and they try and boot it up and it's broken, there won't be tears. So, I started by designing the versioning system and then also went through all the steps to read and write a save. So the game has to save the files on a designated and also guaranteed writable location on the user's device. Um, of course, this location does change depending on the operating system. Knowing that I just had to write a file to the disk somewhere, I decided to go with the JSON file format, which is a very popular, usable, readable file format, and also my engine already supports it, so that's amazing. So when the game comes to try and pass a save file, it will first check for that version entry. If it doesn't find it at all, then it just assumes that the file is broken. So with that version number, I then would have to be able to find the specific parser that's able to deal with this type of file. So the way I did this was that I abstracted the parser class object and then would inherit it based on the parser versions. So the idea is that every single version of the game would be able to pass all the various file formats, even the much older ones. Because it's worth remembering that I can't just have one implementation of the file passing procedure, because I don't necessarily know what version of the file system I'm going to be passing. To make it all as straightforward as possible, I have this save manager class, which is really just responsible for managing the whole read and write procedure and also dealing with abstracting away a lot of the horrible nastiness of the system as a whole. All the programmer has to do is ask the save manager to read or write to that specific location. And then they don't really have to think about a lot of the nastiness that goes on underneath. So essentially the way I solved the old save file problem is that I kind of build up what I called a chain of passes. So you would know from your version header which sort of minimum version you are, and then you'd also know which current version of the game you're at. So say you had to go up the chain like this, what you do is you start with an older parser, and then you'd know the parser above it, so that would allow it to change to a certain format. It would be able to add or change or mutate or whatever, any of the necessary data to get it fit and ready for that specific version of the parser scheme. And then, if you had to keep going up the chain, then you just do that procedurally, until you get to the most recent parser, which is the one that the current version of the game should just be able to completely understand. Um, in theory, if you can do that chain completely, then you will have achieved a point where you've taken an old version of the file system and updated it to the newer one. But the thing is, a lot of this is really just like in theory at the moment. I can't necessarily guarantee it's going to work because I don't have all the various versions of the parsers, but I'm working under the assumption that that should work properly fine. So. I do also do a bit of validation for the input, so I'm using a system called JSON Schema, which is where you sort of have like a companion JSON file, which tells you about all the keys and then the type you expect for that, and then you can just compare that with your finished JSON file. So that is actually a really clever way to validate JSON. The thing is, I don't think I'm going to be too strict about validating the saves themselves, just because I'm very much a believer that like, if the player wants to cheat on the game piece of entertainment that they've paid money for, 
then I don't really mind them wanting to do that. Like, it's not a multiplayer game. I think what I care more about is just that it doesn't destroy players' save files because I really don't want to have to tech support my way through all that sort of thing. So if that's how you read a file, then the next step is obviously going to be how you write a file. The thing is that what the game stores in memory can, in theory, just be dumped to the disk as JSON. So that's fine. So the problem is that if you go to overwrite a save file, what you've essentially had to do is delete it first and then start writing some new values over the top. Now the problem is that if anything, literally anything goes wrong in that bit in between, which probably can be quite likely, then you're going to end up in a situation where you've just completely deleted the save file. So the failsafe I came up with to solve this problem is actually quite straightforward. All I really do is create a folder next to the original save, begin writing my save file to that, and then assuming that all works fine, I do a validation step where I then try and pass it just using the same read procedure as when you actually read the save file in. Check it's a completely valid save. By that point, you then have that valid save in place and you're able to begin to move it in. The remaining dangerous bit is the two file system operations, which is essentially the delete of the old file and then the moving into place of the new one. As much as I had to spend a good few days on that system, as well as actually planning it ahead, I did think it was worth getting right. The save selection screen was then updated to actually do something and then it would just load the save in and populate the global data structures with that. I set up the exploration completed screen to trigger a save write and then the player could just level up accordingly and actually keep their progress. Wow. That was of course something that was really exciting to see as I had been missing that in the game for a while. I do still need to test this a lot more but I would really be testing for quite weird scenarios like what if instead of a JSON file there's just a directory in its place? These are the sort of things you kind of have to assume but for most of the happy path it works fine at the moment. So. Now let's talk about the gameplay changes. So firstly, I wanted to make it so the player could recover the health that they'd lost. So I created these sort of collectible health orb things. They do beat a bit like a heart. I thought that was quite an interesting idea, but I would still like to spruce it up a bit. I mean, you know the drill. I'll make it look better later on. Previously, places used to trigger the player to get a bunch of coins, but there was no like real gameplay aspect to this. It was just, you got coins. So I kind of wanted to try and improve that a bit. So now I've got these collectible coin items that kind of scatter around the floor and you actually have to walk up to them to collect them. Now the thing is I quite like that idea so I wanted to make it so that the enemies themselves would actually drop these coins because that would give you extra loot and we all love loot. The problem was previously enemies were just hard coded to drop a bunch of EXP orbs on death. There was no real system of like this is how many coins you should get or this is how many orbs you should get or anything like that. So I designed a proper loot dropping sort of spoil system. The thing was that I was really also planning for the future there so it took a bit longer. It's sort of designed in a way where you'd also be able to drop things like items when I actually come to implement items. I don't have them yet. So basically when you go to generate the enemy you just generate all the different spoils that it drops and then when it's killed the spoils component gets activated and the world just spawns all those different things that it was meant to spawn into the world. Okay next thing let's talk about some improvements I made to the region generation system. Regions appear as the player moves around the world, the idea being that the world is sort of revealing itself to you as you explore. The problem was that the way I was assigning the regions themselves, you'd often end up with one region just being like the uber region. And the problem was that sort of broke the illusion that you were undoing this patchwork hidden design of the world because everything just appeared at once. The system I built was flexible enough that all I had to do was really deal with which region ID was assigned to each voxel. So I could play around with the algorithms to do the assignment. Specifically, I wanted to experiment a bit with a Veroni algorithm, which would be responsible for dividing the world up into these small sort of triangle bits. But then I would also include my previous approach of this lazy flood fill algorithm, which would just allow me to stick these different patchwork blob things into the map. And I think that should help to give it a bit more of an organic look. Veroni itself isn't really that difficult to generate. You just have to scatter a bunch of random points around the map. And then for each voxel, you decide which of the points is the closest. And that gives you this pattern. The problem I had really was that it just gives you a very jagged look. It doesn't properly look natural. It definitely helped divide the world into chunks. Ignore that bit. But it just didn't really look natural. Splattering the odd lazy flood fill algorithm around the area did help, definitely. But I think I've definitely resigned myself to the realization that the map generation thing is not going to be done. It's going to be continually developed alongside the game. So I think I've definitely made an improvement to regions. It's just that it's not really where it needs to be yet. 
But one of the important things for regions is that you want there to be a bit of like pizzazz when you find something. You don't want everything just to be green fields. So I did something which I'd sort of been planning for a while, which is just to add more biomes. I actually did this right at the end of the development cycle. The, the problem was that I didn't really have enough time to do it properly. And I ended up having to do a lot of the legwork to get some of these new systems in place. Like for instance, how do you make it so that when you discover a place, it spawns a load of collectible objects? That was something I had to implement for this. It didn't really take too long. And the idea was that you'd scatter them around in the actual map gen system. So it's already predetermined where they're gonna be. Um, and then the player just walks into the area and the world just knows to go and spawn those in those, that area. It does still have quite a few problems though, one of the main ones being that the orbs are still placed in the ocean because the map gen doesn't really distinguish between like water and land. For now it's fine. The thing is I can see how the region system is going to start to come together quite quickly. I just need to get that variety in place. Anyway, now it's that part of the video where we talk about small improvements. In the spirit of the new year, I went through and removed a pile of code from the previous gameplay that had been dormant and very stanky for a long time. This was very satisfying to do. I enjoy seeing all the red in the git commits. That stuff had been there for ages and I knew I'd have to get rid of it at some point. It was nice to be able to do that. I improved the system to spawn distractions. Previously, you were just as likely to get a 50-50 encounter as you were to get an EXP orb. The new system I've designed gives me a few more variables to tweak and hopefully a more reliable spawning rate. The mini map now shows discovered places, which is pretty useful. Rivers now have to be a certain length before they get drawn, which helps prevent any weird looking rivers like this one. And I finally did something I'd been planning for quite a while, which was I used my new collision world system to make sure that the generated places in the map are appropriately spaced out from each other. And I also added this voxel color picker tool, which really just allows you to click on a color in the screen and it will tell you it's appropriate voxel ID. I always used to have to do that by like one, two, three, four, five with my finger. That's not the way to do it. And of course there was the standard amount of general bug fixes and improvements that you'd almost certainly come to expect from this sort of thing. Sorry, I'm having a stretch. Right, finally, let's talk about the improvements that were made in preparation for the release. I got the game working on my Linux laptop again and that involved porting all the ambient occlusion changes over to the OpenGL shader system. At the moment there's a bug with the Vulkan render system um, which is meant to be fixed in the next version of Ogre. The problem is that I then of course have to wait for that to be released. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with OpenGL for the moment I think. A lot of this work was just being done in preparation for me to release it on Windows. The thing is that the Linux build is far stabler than the Windows build ever was and I would have had to do the shader port anyway, so in theory, it should just work out of the box on Windows. In theory. I also tested the game on my parents' Intel iMac and it all built fine, which I was just really happy with. The thing is, I invested quite a lot of time in automating like engine builds and engine dependency builds. That was something that just used to be a massive nightmare for me. I spent a long time just getting scripts that could do that for me and I was just really pleased to see that I hadn't touched the scripts in a long time, I just ran them, they built all the dependencies and then I was just able to build the engine and run the game. So that was great. So I'd like to talk a bit about the plan for the alpha release that's coming up. It's going to be um, quite clandestine and quite sort of minimal. I don't want it to be a big fanfare event. Um, the thing is that I think there's going to be tons of issues still in the game. So um, I would like at some point to have a feature freeze and focus on stability. I did get a lot of work done in December, like a whole lot, more than I thought I would actually. Um, but <laughs> it's still, there's still stuff that needs to be done. So I think it makes a lot of sense to feature, feature freeze at some point. So, I mean, towards the end of December, I sort of cracked a plan of what I was gonna do. I, I was kind of going back and forth because I was thinking it might be quite nice if I could get the alpha release out for the first sort of anniversary of the first video I ever uploaded on this channel. That would have been fun. But I think it makes far more sense to give myself a bit of extra time because I don't know how long it's going to take to edit this video. And I also don't know how long like everything else is going to take. I mean, in my experience, things just take longer than you think they will. So I'm looking at it sort of from the perspective of I would like to drip feed updates to the audience uh, as I go. And I think I'd like to say you're going to get a new alpha release, say, each month. So. Actually, it makes a lot of sense if what I was instead to do was leave it until the end of January to do the first release. Um, in that sense, I'll have time to fix all the issues. Like, I haven't really started on the Windows port yet, or at least stabilizing it. 
Um, there's a big difference between it works on my PC and it will work on your PC, if that makes sense. Um, I just need to stabilize these things. Like, I don't want to have a release a dud product just to get it out the door. Like, um, that, that doesn't really make any sense. So, like, to me, that's the most intelligent thing. Um, and then, then in that sense, you know, once I've got a lot of this infrastructure to actually do the releases, then from there on, it will really just be adding features and that sort of thing. So, like, I'll dump it on GitHub or a website or something like that. Um, the, the the more the more fanfare releases are going to come later when I've actually had some people to play the game and they can see and just check that it all makes sense. There's no glaring issues with it. Then I'll start kind of bringing it to that wider audience. One thing I will say though is if you're interested in hearing more, then you should definitely join the official Other Mythos Discord server. We've had some pretty good interaction in there already, which I was quite surprised at. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, but, you know, it seems like we've got a nice little community brewing there, and I think it's going to be really helpful when we actually come to start releasing demos. And another thing to mention, with the upcoming alpha release, I'm going to be experimenting with a different type of video next week. <gasps> and yes, I did say next week. I've been regrouping, reassessing, scheming and conniving. So, happy new year, you glorious bastards. New year, new me. I'll see you then. Ow. It should just work out of the box on Windows, in theory. It looks like you haven't set up any smart home Me just saying, in theory, set off Hey Siri. Shut up. Okay. <laughs>